Y'all may be seated. You know, it's a great thing to be in God's house today. You know, I just want to I just want to praise God for the worship of his people and and how we lift him up. And um, what, a, what a blessing to have the opportunity to spend some time with youth this weekend, uh, Jeff leading them, and, and uh, the fact that one of them gave their heart to Jesus. I mean, Amen. folks, this is why we do what we do, is so that people will come to know Jesus in a very personal way. And I'm very excited about that. I'm excited about the young man who gave his life to Jesus. I'm excited about what God has in store for him. Because the best decision that I ever made was to give my life to Jesus. And, And you know, when it happens when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, you have your entire life to live for him. And what a blessing that is. You know, my, my dear friend Milton Cunningham, he, he once told me, he said, if God isn't working in your area, it ain't his fault. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and this morning, I just, I praise God for the truth of his word. I praise God that his word is authoritative in our lives. And this message this morning, I, I want it to be an encouragement to you. I want it to be something that, that you draw encouragement for. And it's a very practical message that hopefully will help us. Um, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, and we're beginning a, um, a study, if you will, in the book of Colossians. Over the next several weeks, we'll be looking at the book of Colossians. And I just wanted you to understand that, that you know, in God's Word is everything that we need. God's Word is truth. God, God's word is authoritative for our lives. It's our handbook for, for everything that we need. And, and really, in Colossians, what you see is you see uh, the fact that Jesus Christ is all-sufficient. That he is everything that we need, is Jesus Christ. And, and I just want to lift him up this morning. You know, as we get into this, I want to give you just a little bit of background on it. You know, Paul had never seen or even met with this church. And he writes this letter from prison. He's writing from prison, and, and it's, it's one of his disciples, Epaphras, who had actually founded this church. And so he was, he was out helping uh, establish churches, and shortly after Epaphras founded this church, the church of Colossae, a group of false teachers moved in and, and uh, basically began causing division. And from the clues in this letter, it seems that this group was influenced by Gnostic teaching. And, and really, uh, the word Gnostic comes from a Greek word, uh, gnosko, which means to know. To know. And they said in order for a person to be saved, or in order for them to be sanctified, they had to experience, they had to experience supernatural knowledge. Something outside, something they had to experience this outside supernatural knowledge, and they, they needed new revelation. Folks, this is very much like many of the cults and many of liberal Christian groups today. They teach that the relevant revelation of Scripture is not enough. But what I'm telling you today is that God's Word is true, and God's Word is enough. God's word is enough. You know, the Bible is either, they, say, they would say that either the Bible is not true or we need human reasoning to test the writings of Scripture to see what is true. And they declare that the revelation of Scripture is not enough and that there is a new authoritative revelation that we must all hear. See, this Gnostic teaching, just like Satan in the Garden of Eden, Attack the very foundation of our faith, the Word of God. Did God really say? Did He really mean what He said? See, because the the Colossian church was experiencing this teaching, it was in great trouble. 
And Paul sits down and he pins this letter and the the ground of their faith had been shaken as Satan through false teaching had attacked the gospel message and had attacked Christ himself. But as we look at this prayer this morning that the Apostle Paul wrote for the church, we we learn a lot about how we should pray for God's church which is always being attacked from without and within. See, this prayer shows us how we can intercede for the body of Christ throughout the world for believers that we know and believers that we don't know. The body of Christ. The the characteristics of, of prayer in this text will strengthen our own prayer life if we will apply the principles. I want to look at the text now and and see what we can learn here. We're going to be in Colossians. If you have your scripture and want to open up to that, we're going to be in chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading uh, verses 9 through 14. And it's Paul's prayer for the the church at Colossae. And um, let's read together. Verse 9 says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, your word stands forever. Things fall away, things pass away, but your word stands forever. Father, what a joy it is to know you and to know your word. I pray, Father, that as we study, as we learn more about you, that we would know you better. And Father, that that would lead to changes in our lives. Father, that through that we would become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. In our thoughts, in our actions, in our motivations, in our life. Father, we love you. I ask Holy Spirit that you would examine our hearts. That you would shed light into the dark corners of our hearts. That, Father, we too would be able to to look and say, Hey, this isn't right. I need to give this to you, Lord. Father, that you would have your way in our hearts as we submit to you, even as we sing, I surrender all. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the prayers of the Apostle Paul go straight to the heart of our need. I mean, this is something that we need to know. This is something that we need to understand. Because in all of the paganism that was around him, Paul often prayed and encouraged the believers to follow his example. He says, walk as I walk, do as I do. And I think that's huge that we have good models of Christian faith around us. And Paul is encouraging them in that. And Paul, along with Timothy, he wrote, We have not ceased to pray for you. You know what? I hope this message changes your prayer life. That's my desire. Is that as we read God's word and we see how Paul prays, that we would follow Paul's example and that our lives would be changed because of his example. See, we as believers, we have a a great resource in prayer that most of the time we don't access. None of us, none of us, none of our prayer lives are as they could be, probably as they should be. 
See, Paul is a great example of someone who was an intercessory prayer. Someone who prayed for others. And that's what he's doing in this passage. He prayed for God's care and support for the Colossians who were being besieged by false claims of some fellow citizens of Colossae. And, you know, we're all looking to live a life that is meaningful. Amen? I don't want to live a life that's meaningless. Do you? No, we all want to live a life that's meaningful. And Paul is praying for the Colossian church that they would live a life that is meaningful for God. I love this. Because the basis... I want to give you the basis for a meaningful life according to Paul here. And the basis for a meaningful life is found in the knowledge of God's will. Knowing what God's will is for you. Knowing what God created you to do. Knowing what God put you here for. Having that meaningful life. Having a full knowledge of God's will. Are are, are we really concerned about finding God's will for our lives? I mean, we might say, yeah, we're concerned about that. (laughs) Paul was. He wrote it down (laughs) that you would have a full knowledge of God's will. See, this prayer was often voiced for him. But understand this. Some of us inquire about the will of God for our lives. We might ask the question, what is God's will for our life? without the commitment to do his will. This is interesting. Because a lot of times what happens is, is God will not reveal his will for us until we commit to doing it. But you see, we are control freaks. And we don't want to commit to anything until we know the end. And, and, and God is like, I'm not going to give you what you need until you commit to this. I guarantee you, when we commit to it, we will know God's will. It will hit us like a two by four upside the head. Listen to this. According to John 7, 17, Jesus said this. He said, if anyone is willing to do his will. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, if you are willing to do it, if you are committed to it, you will know what he's saying. The problem is, is we say, Lord, I need to know your will. But we have no earthly desire to do what he's asking us to do. Why would he tell us what it is? Just so we would know? No, he wants us to carry it out. But until we're committed to carrying it out, he's not going to give it to us. See, this knowledge is to be realized in two ways. And Paul says it this way. He says with wisdom, spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. Those two things. With wisdom and understanding. And wisdom is the grasping, uh, the apprehending, if you will, of moral principles. And understanding what he's talking about there is actually applying them to your life. Doing it. See, God's word contains everything that we need. I want to pull the truck over and stop the truck and pull it over the side of the road for a whole minute here. Okay? We live in a society where there is a rejection of absolutes. We live in a society where there is a rejection of absolutes. And because of that, behavior is extremely relative. Instead of being anchored here in God's word, we are anchored here and here and here and here and here. And so from wherever we stand, it's relative. We think that that is truth. But from the Christian viewpoint, from the biblical viewpoint, all behavior is connected to reveal truth. What we do reveals the truth. All positive, good behavior is linked to reveal truth. Everything, no exceptions, everything in the behavior of a Christian must be connected to reveal truth. Because truth is the basis for all right action 
I mean, there must be absolutes before there can be any requirement for action. I mean, think about this. If you drive 100 miles an hour down the highway and you get stopped by a state trooper, you're going to be fined for unacceptable behavior. It's not acceptable because there's an absolute. And the absolute says that the speed limit is 70. It applies to everyone all the time. It's the same. It's an absolute. The speed limit is 70. If you go to Dillard's and you find something that that you would like and you don't want to use your cash or you don't want to use your your debit card or, 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 or write a check, so you just decide you want to take it. And you start on your way out and quite possibly you're going to be arrested. And that would be, you'd be charged with a crime because there's an absolute. Shoplifting, stealing things that don't belong to you is a crime. That's an absolute. See, absolutes are the basis for determining moral quality of any action. See, all acceptable behavior in our society is based on these absolutes. Now, if, if you want another term for absolutes, you can call them laws. Uh, that's what laws are, is absolutes. But think about this. If we removed all the absolutes, if we had no laws, there would be no way to evaluate anyone's actions. From a moral standpoint, we couldn't judge anyone's behavior. There'd be no way to enforce anything. Good behavior wouldn't even uh, be able to be defined, let alone enforced, because you would remove the standards. So there has to be, there must be absolutes. There must be a bottom line law, and then behavior can be evaluated. See, all the behavior of of a Christian is premised on God's absolutes. God lays down principles and then we behave in relation to those principles. See, we need to understand that people, as Christians, we need to voluntarily obey the law. Young people, we need to voluntarily obey the law. How will we ever be obedient to God if we don't obey the law? I mean, these are the absolutes. God lays down principles and we behave in relation to those principles. And it's only in response to the knowledge of those absolutes that we behave in a proper manner. We have to know what those laws are. The only way to have right behavior then is to have right knowledge. And that's what Paul is saying. He's praying for the the Colossian church that they would have right knowledge. A full knowledge of God's will. I mean, think about it. How do I know what to do in my marriage if I don't know what the standards are? If I don't know what the standards are, it doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want. But because there is a standard, because there is an absolute, I know what God's law says about marriage and what it means. How do I know what to do in my job if I don't know what the Bible teaches about it? How do I know what to do in worship if I don't know what God expects in that? How do I know how to be born again if I don't follow the absolutes of Scripture? How do I know anything if I don't understand God's patterns, His standards, His law? Because He is the one who created us. He is the one who who created us, who, who fashioned us, who made us. And He's the one that knows. And He's given us the owner's manual. So what Paul is saying here in Colossians verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And now we pray for you. And and what is the objective of of our prayers? The desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. 
That you would know exactly what His will is. See, you have to have that foundation of knowledge before behavior can, can spring from it. You know, to, you know, to know God and to know His will. And then you can submit and make your life conformed to His desire. But if you don't know, you'll never do it. See, God always has a basis of revealed truth upon which behavior is established. And unless a believer understands that revealed truth, then he's going to have a difficult time trying to determine what moral behavior is really all about. I mean, you, you can't live right unless you know the principles. You must know the absolutes. Enough on that. I need to move on. I want to tell you about the goal of a meaningful life. The goal of a meaningful life in, in verse 10 says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. See, the goal of, of our life is to glorify God in everything that we do. To please Him. <laughs> so don't pray to be filled with God's will if you're full of your own will. <laughs> I mean, we need to give God a blank piece of paper, not a contract we'd like him to sign. Amen. And by the way, when you pray this for a full knowledge of God's will, he's going to let you know. But when you get God's leading, do it before you change your mind. Because the enemy comes in and he says, hey, did God really say that? Man, people are going to think you're crazy, Ridge, if you pack your family up and move to Texas. You're going to be a minister? What? Yeah. Do it before the enemy gets a hold and changes your mind. I mean, do you serve to please God or to please other people? I mean, would you dare to serve God just for the joy of serving Him? If there was no accolades, if there was no attaboys, if there was no praise from anyone ever? Just for the joy of serving Almighty God. It's a fair question because we like our egos stroke, don't we? We like to hear people praise us. We like to hear people say thank you. But what if the, the, the whole point was to serve him and him alone? And it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks or does or how they respond to you. I mean, the basic motivation for serving is the wisdom and spiritual understanding which Paul prayed for. Then when that service is given, it will be entirely pleasing to God. If you're doing that with spiritual wisdom and understanding, walk worthy or walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that refers to the kind of life that responds to being in Christ. I mean, it means that we will live in such a way that our living will conform. It will look like our union with Christ. It will look like we belong to Christ. The goal of a meaningful life is to please God in everything. Some characteristics that Paul gives us here. Uh, these characteristics include fruitfulness, uh, growth, strength, gratitude. I mean, these are how a meaningful life can be attained. Put these things in your life. Fruitfulness, growth, strength, and gratitude. See, a meaningful life is characterized by fruitfulness. I think it was W.A. Criswell said, God warned us against being judges but he made us fruit inspectors <laughs> and, and, and it's one thing when we look at the fruit in someone's life you know especially our own but when you talk about uh, what Jesus said in Matthew 7 uh, verse 16 he said this he said you will know them by their fruits grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles are they and so the loudest proclaimers sometimes the loudest proclaimers are sometimes <laughs> the poorest performers. 
They put on a flashy show and, oh man, look at this. Look what I'm doing. Look at all this. But then there's not fruit. And that's really what he's saying here. A meaningful life is characterized by fruitfulness. When we are submitted to the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit will move us and will bear fruit through us. I would say also a meaningful life is characterized by growth. And the growth Paul refers to is an increase in the knowledge of God. It's both the means and the motivation for growth. I mean, fruit cannot be produced in your life on your own power. I mean, it's a basic horticultural fact that branches that have been cut off from the tree won't be producing any fruit. They usually end up in a burn pile somewhere. But the same is true for fruit in our lives. We've got to abide in Christ. We've got to abide in Him. Be tied in, be connected to Him. Because if we're not, we won't bear fruit. But Scripture tells us that when we are, we will produce much fruit. John 15, 5, 4 and 5 says, Abide in me, Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, fruit bearing refers to those outward signs that other people see. But spiritual growth... (laughs) It talks about the inward spiritual fullness. It's talking about being filled with the Spirit. It's talking about being full with God and the knowledge of His will. And so what happens is, is the, as we're filled up and, and healthy on the inside and full of, of Him, what happens is He bears fruit outside that others see. I think that's huge. You know, the problem is, is many of us should be teachers at this point. We've sat under the word of God for so long. We've overheard the gospel. We've heard it so much, we've become desensitized to it. We're no longer excited about what God's word says. We should be teachers by now. But we're not. You know why? Because we're still on the milk of the word. We've not moved into the harder things. Hebrews 5 talks about that. 5 verse 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And then you have not come, excuse me, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who can practice, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I mean, I love that because you know what it says? It says every one of us can be teachers. It's not about having the gift. It's about sharing what you already know. A meaningful life is also characterized by spiritual strength. (laughs) I mean, there is absolutely no justification for a weak Christian when God and the power of God is available to us. I mean, the the, the power which Paul prayed for is proportional, and it says his glorious might to his glorious might. And this word is a a, a simple Greek word, uh, dunamai, Dunamis, that is usually translated to be able. To be able. As in, I'm able to scratch my nose. I am not able to flap my arms and fly. It doesn't work that way. See, when we open ourselves up to the work of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to fill our lives, He gives us power. He gives us might. But what I would say more importantly, He gives us ability. The dunamis. We are able to. I mean, we often think about the Holy Spirit's work as giving us dynamite power. 
I'm not going to go back in the 70s, you know. Dying on my. But it's probably better to think of it as dynamic power rather than dynamite power. And that the Holy Spirit makes you able, as in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit makes you able, makes us able to be his witnesses. Now, if we're thinking about dynamite all the time, you know, with the Holy Spirit, we might sit around waiting for a 10,000 volt jolt, you know, to, to, to in, in empower us to do something. But the truth is more like this. Hey, I am now able to do this. God is able to do this through me. And I didn't have that power before. See, there's a goal to this power and we need in our lives. And it's not power necessarily to part oceans and to move mountains, but it's something much more practical, much more daily. The word that Paul uses He says, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Uh-oh. Patience. You have the power of God in you to be able to be patient. Oh, we don't want to pray for patience, but we need to pray for the power of patience in our lives. Steadfastness, constancy, endurance. See, the person who has this does not stop doing the right thing for God even when life gets its hardest. When things get difficult, they continue to praise God. They continue with God in their life. They continue to reach out and be a blessing to others. And some of you today are going through some very difficult times. I mean, maybe you're struggling Economically, like our nation is, people out of work, businesses struggling. Maybe there's things like health issues that you are struggling with. We need patience. We need endurance. We need the ability to keep walking with the Lord in difficult days. I mean, some of you have very difficult people in your life. I mean, it may be somebody at work that's riding you hard. It may be a marriage or a relationship that you're struggling in right now. It may be a child that is rebellious. In all these things, we need us some long suffering. And I want to say also with joy. It's one thing to put up with difficult people. But to do it with joy too. I'd say that's a great reason to need God's power. Don't forget all these things. uh, Deep things here are inside Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And this power will produce patience and long suffering. And as I wrap this up. I just want to say that a meaningful life is characterized also by gratitude. That's what he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It all starts with thanks. Thanksgiving is the gate into the presence of Almighty God. It's the best way to approach God. I mean, why should we be grateful? Paul gives us three reasons there. I mean, we've been qualified for an inheritance. (laughs) That's always good news. We've been made citizens of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. (laughs) And the best news is we have experienced redemption. We've been saved for all eternity. You know, if you, really, if you really want God to be at work in your life, we've got to learn to spend time in prayer. 
And I'm going to tell you, it's not easy. There is something within me, there is something within you that doesn't want to pray. Oh, we can open up our Bible and we can do our daily Bible reading. It's a lot easier to do that than it is to open up your prayer list and begin to intercede for someone else. Praying these things for them. That they would have a full knowledge of, will, of God's will. That they would be filled. That they would be fruitful. That they would be spiritually growing. That they would have the, the long-suffering and difficult times. That they would be thankful to God. It's a lot harder to do that. And none of our prayer lives are what they should be. We could all do better. See, Paul's prayer is for every child of God. And it's within our grasp if we will seek God's will and follow him. Living that life of service to others for an audience of one. See, I would challenge you this morning to pick one of these areas. Pick one of these areas that Paul prayed for and pray for it for yourself every day for a month. Pray that prayer. Ask God to do what he can do, and I guarantee you it will change your life. Pray for others. I mean, you ought to have a few people that you're willing to commit to pray for every day. But knowing God's will, what a, what a tremendous prayer to know God's will. Walking worthy, being fruitful, knowing him better, strengthened for patience. Pick one. Pick one. And pray. Pray. Loving Father, I thank you for this time. And we thank you, Father, for your word. And Father, I know that I know that you challenge me in, in, in this area. And Father, I know that your Holy Spirit calls me to times of prayer throughout the day. And Father, I'm not all that unusual. I'm sure other people experience that too. But Father, I pray that we would be people of prayer, that, that your church would be a house of prayer. And Father, that we would desire to please you in all that we are and all that we say and all that we do. And Father, that we would give you first place in our life. God, that we would submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that we would want to grow, that we would desire fruitfulness. And God, that we would abide in Jesus in order for that to happen. Father, I pray that you would quicken our hearts. Father, that our prayers wouldn't be lengthy, but Father, that they would be powerful. And God, that you would put your spirit upon your people and that we would desire more of you and less of us. Father, that we would continue to see men and women and sons and daughters come to faith in Jesus Christ because we are praying for the souls of men and women. Father, that we would recognize the time that you've given to us in this time and in this place to be the salt and light that you call us to be. Father, I pray for hearts of fire. Father, I pray for a Holy Spirit anointing upon every believer in this place that you would empower us to know your will and to do your will. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.